In late December 1924, Floyd Collins made a huge discovery of a cave that was going to change his life forever. He spent the next several weeks digging into the cave, but after finally entering it, a little mistake would see him trapped under the rocks, freezing and starving to death. The events surrounding his rescue would invite thousands to the cave and even draw the attention of the president. But none of this would do Floyd any good. This is the tragic story of the infamous Floyd Collins. Lucky cave explorer Floyd Collins has been trapped in Sand Cave. Collins was negotiating a small cavern tunnel when he was pinned by fallen rocks and debris at 10 a.m. on Friday morning. So far, efforts to free him have been unsuccessful. When William Floyd Collins discovered Sand Cave in late December 1924, it was a turning point for him because it was easily accessible by tourists since it was just 100 yards from a highway. He quickly struck a deal with the owners of this property to get 50% of the profits from the exploration of it. After this, he immediately went to work on the cave. But there was no real opening to the cave yet, which is why many tourists avoided it at all this time. But Floyd was determined. So for the next few weeks, he spent hours every day digging deeper and deeper into the hole, widening the passageways, and removing several loose rocks as he did, all in an attempt to create a suitable opening to the cave. After a few more days, he came very close. On January 30th, 1925, he went again, but he would be shocked by what he would find. It was snowing that morning when Floyd made his way into the hole with a kerosene lantern in hand. He was getting used to the darkness and dampness of the hole, so he had no problem navigating his way through the tunnel after dropping through the first crevice. To get through the tunnel, Floyd fell to his knees and started to crawl forward. He then came face to face with a turnaround point. This is where many cave explorers before Floyd stopped and literally turned around to exit their exploration. This is because of what lay ahead, a tiny opening that a toddler would have a hard time going through. This opening was called The Squeeze and was only 9 inches tall. No one has ever dared to go beyond this point. Well, no one until Floyd. He lay down flat on the ground, tucked in his stomach to reduce the mass of his body as much as possible, and started pushing himself through the hole with just his feet. While he was making considerable progress, the walls of the hole contained pointy gypsum crystals that held onto his clothes and made his movement almost impossible. But after a while, he came through to the other side. Here, the space is also small, but it offers adequate movement, and ahead was a ledge that drops off a narrow pit. Floyd had been able to open this pit on previous days by removing small rocks, but it was still the size of a chimney. He started down the pit, feet first, taking care against the sharp rocks. When he reached the pit, he was excited to know that the next drop would lead him straight to the big cave he had so desperately wanted. He was able to squat in the little space that the pit afforded and he started to remove the final rocks and debris. His efforts opened up a hole that led down to the main cave. Then he tied a rope in place and used it to make the final descent. This last drop was an 80 foot drop so he was extra careful as he pushed himself down. When he eventually reached the floor of the cavern, Floyd was gripped with unimaginable joy to have finally discovered the sand cave. Amazed, he looked around his discovery for some minutes, his eyes welling up, but his attention was drawn by the flickering of the light of his lantern. So he decided to leave quickly before he lost the light. Besides, he was excited to announce his discovery to his family and business partners. He climbed quickly to the top of the last descent, but as he pushed the lantern through the hole, it fell and cracked. The light went out and Floyd was steeped into total darkness. Not losing hope, he continued pushing himself through the opening on the surface, taking care not to knock off any rock that might bring the cave down on him. But in the dark like that, that was exactly what happened. As he was pushing his body upward with his feet, he kicked a loose rock that came out of place and fell on his left leg, trapping it in a dent in the ground. Unable to move that leg, Floyd used his right leg to kick off the rock, but the more he tried, the more other loose rocks fell and landed on and around him, trapping him. His hands and legs were caught under rubble, and his head was pushed to one side by a rock. 
The time was only 10 in the morning, a few hours after he started his exploration, and he started to scream for help immediately, hoping that someone would hear him. But no one did. Hours ticked by painfully until the day ended. Lying there, unable to move, all he could do was pray and hope. His prayers would be answered when the following Saturday morning, almost 24 hours after he got stuck, two of the owners of the property, Ed Estes and B. Doyle, came out to the cave to check on him. Doyle's son, 17-year-old Jewel, was also with them. They found Floyd's coat and hat hanging at the ledge outside and called out his name. No answer. So they went in, going as far as the first squeeze, before giving up their quest because of their sizes. However, Jewel, who was more slender, went through this hole and was able to reach Floyd, whose entire torso was stuck under heaps of gravel and rock. He was excited to see Jewel and told him to go get his brothers to help. By noon, one of Floyd's brothers, Marshall, and their father, Pap, reached the cave to find a crowd at its entrance. Lots of people had gathered to see Floyd's rescue taking place. Marshall and another man entered, passed through the squeeze, and started digging to widen the tunnel leading down to Floyd as they couldn't get in. They were also careful not to let loose rocks fall down the pit as Floyd's head was literally at the bottom already receiving droplets of cold water falling down the pit. Many hours later, Floyd's other brother, Homer, would come to make the difference. He was devastated because on that Friday morning, Floyd had asked him to accompany him into the cave but he didn't go with him. But now, on reaching the cave, he was determined to right his wrongs and get his brother out. He made it through the crowd of people whose numbers were now reaching a hundred and went down to where Marshall and more men were working in the cave. He attempted to make his way through the tunnel that no one had been able to access. He started squeezing his way down, ignoring the pain from the cuts on him made by the roughness of the rocky tunnel. Soon his legs touched Floyd's face and he shuddered but was happy to have finally made physical contact. But things weren't looking good because Floyd's situation was getting worse. The crowd of people outside had started several bonfires which were melting the ice outside the cave, so the droplets of icy water were falling more frequently and rapidly now, making more mud and freezing him further. He told Homer how he had finally seen the cave but said he would never go back in there once he was rescued. After a while, Floyd told his brother to go out and rest. This was eight hours after he first reached Floyd. It was already Sunday morning at the time. When Homer reached the surface, he was enraged to find so many people outside. He started to complain that if they couldn't help, they should get out of the way, but no one listened. The news of Floyd's dilemma had spread like wildfire, and soon reporters arrived and made to interview Homer, who told them with a sneer to go inside and assess the situation for themselves. Later in the afternoon, other people tried to see Floyd. Some did, and some tried but couldn't. One man came out later to report that Floyd was dead. Another told reporters that the pit had caved in. Marshall then offered 500 grand to anyone who could go in there to see his brother, but they all gave the same unfavorable answers. Dead, not seen, caved in. As evening drew close, Homer entered the cave once more to verify the news, and he was happy to find his brother was still alive. Homer continued to remove the little amount of rocks that he could, and by the fourth day of the entrapment, he was able to free Floyd's hands at least. Floyd then asked that they tie a rope around his chest to pull him out. On Tuesday morning, Homer came down with a harness to attempt to pull alongside other men, and with the harness in place, the men started to pull, but after a few minutes of moving his body a little out of the hold, Floyd screamed, Stop! I can't stand it! It's going to pull me in two! So they stopped, and Homer continued removing as much rock as he could for the next couple of hours. But exhaustion and several sustained cuts on his body made him feel sick, so he was placed under treatment and ordered to rest. Then, by Tuesday night, a reporter named Skeets entered the cave and installed a light bulb close to Floyd. As he interviewed him, he also removed a considerable amount of rubble. His efforts were so great that Floyd's legs were now fairly exposed. So he fixed a crowbar, a couple of blocks, and a jack to attempt to lift the rock off Floyd's left foot. But after several attempts, he had to give up that act as well. By the following days, Skeet's interviews had been printed in the papers, and Floyd's unfortunate situation had spread from the radio to people's ears. It had now become a huge spectacle, with people rooting for Floyd's survival, but some were spreading false rumors that nobody was even trapped there in the first place. 
In any case, the outside of the cave had now become a huge carnival. Hotels around were booked solid, prices of commodities were hiked, and hundreds of automobiles lined the roads leading to the cave. There were now at least a thousand people outside the cave. It was worrying enough that all the burning going on was melting the ice inside the cave, but it was even worse that the number of people inside the cave and at the entrance of the pit where Floyd was trapped was just too much. Their activities were weakening the strength of the walls and with no reinforcements made, it was actually expected to collapse any time. But nobody knew about this at that time and they all thought that they were helping. Then, on Wednesday afternoon, the worst happened. While everyone who could reach Floyd was out resting, the entrance to the pit indeed collapsed, blocking any access to Floyd. Luckily, nobody was trapped in with Floyd, and he too also escaped getting knocked by any falling rock. But now, nobody could reach him anymore. The following day, on Thursday, February 5th, 1925, a team of workers was led to create a shaft in the cave to attempt to reach Floyd. As the men worked, the cave was barred from entry so the only way they could know Floyd was still alive was through the light bulb close to his head. It had been fixed in a way that, if Floyd breathed, the wires connected to the bulb would send a signal to the apparatus outside. They continued digging the shaft for several more days with Floyd still stuck there, now without food and water. He was gradually deteriorating, cold, and exhausted of all energy. By Friday the 13th of February, the men had gotten close and one of them even reported that he had heard someone groan 10 feet away from him. However, at 1.30 a.m. Monday, February 16th, one of the workers named Brenner found Floyd, but of course he was already dead. Everyone agreed that the cave should be his final resting place, so the shaft was covered with Floyd's body still stuck in there. But many months later, Homer had it opened, and his brother's body was removed for a proper burial. Here's an even more tragic story that involved two students getting stuck in a pit with freezing water rushing over them for hours. 